turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, I'm not going to put it up on the screen for you. Won't you, Doug? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Father, I just thank you that we all have ears to hear and we have a heart to receive. Lord, I thank you that we are becoming God's purpose in the earth. And I thank you, Lord, we'll walk out, act out, speak out your word in every occasion of life. We thank you, Lord, that your word is working in us to heal us, to bless us, to correct us when we're wrong. And I thank you, Lord, that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And I thank you, Lord, that your word changes us, as the scripture says, from glory to glory, from faith to faith, and from strength to strength. And we'll act from one situation to another situation. You're changing us. Thank you, Lord, that we're growing in the things of the Spirit. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 You know, I don't know how you were raised, but I was raised in an environment where the preachers told us that Jesus is coming tonight. So we never did anything. We didn't plan, we didn't save, didn't go to college. What's the use? You know, in the religious world, every generation thinks of the last one. But uh, I look at inventions and I kind of think outside the box sometimes. I look at inventions and all the things that's done, and just highways and bridges and things that men is able to build. And you know, when I was driving my truck, I was in Chicago and the, the, the roads were stacked up about five high and I'm up on the top, top layer of all these bridges, some going this way, some that way, and there's a wreck, and so I'm up here on top of this bridge, now I'm on my truck stop, I've set my air so my brakes are holding, and the whole bridge is moving so much, my truck's sitting here just like this. I'm sitting still in the truck, and the bridge is moving that much, and I think, Lord, I, I just thank you that you've helped men to figure out how to, <laughs> how to make this stuff, that will handle all of that and not break. And look, and I seen another uh, a, a deal the other day on Facebook said babies are a good sign that the world will continue. <laughs> Amen. So I just, you know, I really believe Jesus is coming sometime. I really believe that. Because we're the body of Christ and we need a head. Here, but there's sure a lot to be done. You know, there are some places they're still arguing over the color carpet to put in the truck, church. We don't, but I've, I've known the church has had church place because the color of the carpet was put in there. That's so frivolous. One guy, I heard him say, you know, he's telling all the world events is happening, and he said, and I look at my church preaching against lipstick. It's so frivolous. You know, it's so petty. Man, the world is hurting and, and uh, people are fighting. And, you know, it's just time to straighten up, get our act together, and love one another. Amen? In Hebrews chapter 2, uh, I want to, I want to, my subject today. Sometimes I don't stay with it. Sometimes, as Linda says, I have a lot of rabbit trails. <laughs> now, Daryl said I fly by the seat of my pants. But <laughs> anyway, uh, if I can stick with my subject, I'd like to talk about identifying your enemy. We hear at church, we hear testimonies, the enemy this, the enemy that, and I listen to preachers on the radio and TV and I'm amazed at how much we all know about the devil, but so little about God. 
And I want us to just to identify our enemy, but for, if we can just identify it, maybe it'll help us get through some struggles that we have. And it, it's, it's kind of like learning about something. First of all, I need to know what it is not. And help to know what it is. Right? So, <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 2 says, I'm going to start with uh, verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things. It bringeth many sons into glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect. We know the captain of our salvation is Christ, right? Let's get that straight. Through suffering. Now, I want to stop here and say, sometimes the church world has went through some segments of Christianity, went through segments of time and, 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 and their experience with God that we all thought everybody had to suffer. I don't know if you went through that. I come through some of that teaching. Everybody had to suffer. I remember Brother Hiles telling about a good friend of his, and I know him too, been in his services several times. He said he went through that teaching that everybody has to suffer. He said, you know, our church was doing good, and we had money in the bank, and my kids weren't on drugs, and everybody's doing good, the church is good, good. Maybe, maybe I'm not a, the elect of God. <laughs> he said, he's walking his great day. And you think about this. And he said the clap of thunder hit, and that scared that dog, and he had a, had a leash ran around his arm, and he said he jerked him down on the curb and messed up his rotator cuff, and he laid there and said, thank you, Jesus. Maybe I am the left of God. <laughs> you know, that's kind of stupid. Amen? And he's seen it later that it was not, not, that's not God's plan. Jesus is the captain of our salvation, and he suffered for us. I'm not saying things don't happen to us, okay? I had, last week was a good week for me, but I didn't think God put it on me. Amen? He suffered for me so that some ladies could come in here and lay hands on me, and I could be healed from that through Christ. Amen? All right. For both he that sanctifies, verse 11, and they that are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name among my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise. And again, I'll put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children which God hath given me. For, listen this, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself took part of the same that through death he, being Christ, might destroy him. And the word destroy means to render entirely ineffective. Now what part of that can we not figure out? I, I mentioned to Tammy the other day, I wonder how many generations it's going to take to get a hold of that truth that the devil has been rendered ineffective. And it says that he might destroy him that had the power that of death, that is who? The devil. Destroy him that had power. He destroyed his place. He destroyed his place of authority. Now in the Old Testament, the devil did have power over death, but Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18, all power is given me in heaven and earth. All power. Not a little bit of it. Not the devil has a fourth. Not that I've got three fourths. I'm bigger than him. You know, I see a lot of stuff on, on Facebook. It, 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 it seems like God's over here and the devil's over there and we're in an arm wrestling match. It's not like that. Jesus said, all power is given me in heaven and in earth. Then he said, go you and do, you know, basically do what I did. I want us to turn, uh, don't you get John chapter 12. This is big John. John chapter 12. Joyce, you can go ahead and write those definitions on there. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. <coughs> pay attention to her, me and let her go ahead and write. We'll get to her stuff in a minute. It says, now is the judgment of this world. When did he say it was? Now. Now, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Now Jesus was talking to those around him. He's not went to the cross yet, but he's telling them what, what his mission is. He said, now is the judgment of this world. How many preachers you still hear talk about America's coming under the judgment of God? Now listen, Jesus took that on the cross. So much that. So much that. The Bible says his visage. Yeah. Let me say it this way. Put it in our cast canopy lean over here. You couldn't hardly recognize him as a man. He was beaten almost beyond recognition. And he did took that for us. Amen. But at the same time, he was rendering Satan powerless. It looked like he was a loser. It looked like Christ was a loser. But three days later, he proved that he was a winner. Okay? So it says, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Now I looked up the word prince in the concordance. And the concordance has, the Strong's concordance has all the words of the King James Bible in it. And what its Greek and Hebrew meanings were. And Prince said, first in rulership. First in rulership. So what happened when Adam sinned in the garden, he gave his authority to Satan. Satan now has the rulership in the earth. The, Paul says he's the prince and power of the air. So he was the ruler all through the Old Testament. We see men of God would do great exploits, but the, the Bible tells us that the Spirit would move on them to do a job and then lift off. Because sometimes after they did great exploits of great things, then they go do something stupid. <laughs> but once Jesus came, he died, was buried, resurrected, and said, all powers given me in heaven and earth. When he went back into the Father, he left a deposit of himself in the earth called the Holy Spirit. In every man, woman, boy, and girl, he didn't leave anybody out. That's what the Holy Spirit's drawn to, is that seed of God that's in everybody. But we're still looking at good boys and bad boys, good girls and bad girls, amen? You know why? We're still eating off the tree of knowledge of good and evil. When we begin to eat off the tree of life, I'm not saying there's not bad out there. I'm not sticking my head in the sand and saying it's not out there. But the Lord gave me a little application how to apply this. Have you ever seen some little boy on a stage? I seen one on the, on the internet the other day. He's about four years old and he took a violin and played it masterfully. I seen another little boy seven years old playing a guitar and singing so professional. I look into kids like that and I see talents. Now he hasn't committed any crimes, right? At four years old or five. We look into that child and we see talents and we see giftings and we see things that God has put in those kids. Maybe when they're 15 they might have went out and shot somebody. Are you with me? But when they're little, we just saw those giftings. And the Lord said, if you'll see people like that, see giftings in them, see callings, and, 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 and if you'll see that and quit seeing all the bad stuff they're doing, I wonder how many generations it take to change this world. If we can just see that. But we still see the bad. We are still eating off the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And start, let's start eating off the tree of life and just seeing that person. You know, I heard this story. Let me remember Paul's, Paul Harvey on the radio. And he'd say, and, he, and here's the rest of the story. He said his little baby was born. His mother oohed and 
His mother loved him, took him to the neighbors, the neighbors loved him. He grew up, went to school, went to college, studied theology, just told all good things about him. And he said, and his name is Adolf Hitler. Somewhere, something happened. You know, as much as he hated the Jews, do you know his mother was Jewish? He had, he had abusive parents. Both of them were, I read, were very abusive. Anyway, something happened in him that changed him to be as horrible and horrendous as he was. If somebody could have contributed, kept nurturing the good stuff, he might have become a great leader. But he's went down in history as one of the worst. In John chapter 14, a couple of pages over, verse 30, uh, here again, Jesus had not went to the cross yet. And he says this, Hereafter I will, I will not talk much of, with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. Hath nothing in me. Now can go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. Uh, we'll start with verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with all the knowledge of his will. You know, what we're lacking is understanding God's will and testament. You know, you got one group saying he's out to get you. One group says, oh, you can do anything you want to. Another group has something else to say. If we could just understand the knowledge of God's will, what his will and purpose is in the earth, why, why this humanity hasn't been wiped off the face of the earth, there's a purpose for us. Amen. If we can understand that. He said he prays that it will be filled with the knowledge of the will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord in all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Have you ever heard somebody testify and say, just pray that I'll, I'll get closer to the Lord. Now, I've said that myself. I haven't said it in a long time because I have a better understanding. What we're really saying is, we, if God's in you, you can't have any more of him than all. Right? If God's in you, you can't have more of him. He just, he's all. And I make this statement, and I'll say it again. Uh, I, I'm full of of the knowledge of God. It just hasn't all been revealed yet. What I don't know still makes a bigger book than what I know, but what I'm learning is really wonderful. <laughs> but it's not all been revealed yet. There's, there's things that I still struggle with in Scripture. I struggle with uh, being wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. I still struggle with that Scripture. I still struggle with the Scripture that God turned his back on Jesus at the cross. I still struggle with that. I haven't got it all together. But it's piece by piece, some of it's coming together for me. Amen? And, and so every time I get another piece of the puzzle that's put together, I feel like I'm closer to God. I'm not closer to God because I've got all of him in me, and you have too. But little by little, the covers is coming off, and we're kind of seeing a little more understanding of the will of God, the purpose of God in the earth, and what I'm, what's my part, what's my, my uh, understanding my fellowship of the sufferings of God, where am I part of this? And the more I learn that, the more I've, I feel like I'm closer to God. I'm not any closer, I'm just knowing a little bit more about it. Amen. Uh, let me finish it. Verse 10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with what? Was it you got it up there? Where are you at? What verses he got? There you go. With joyfulness. Ah, don't like that one. I like to be mad. <laughs> no way. 
<laughs> we should have bust one of the bricks, man. <laughs> That's not what he says to do, though. Amen. Strengthen with all might, according to his glorious power, and all patience, and long suffering, with joyfulness. You know, patience, we learned last week, was, was what? Cheerful endurance. Oh, I fail there so much. <laughs> I didn't get very cheerful sometimes while I was enduring. Sometimes I didn't even endure. <laughs> I said things that was mean and hateful. and You know, that's getting further and further and farther apart. You know, thank the Lord. We're just learning and growing in the knowledge of God. So giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet. That's an old English word for able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. Here's my verse. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. It's, that's a spiritual uh, saying. That's, uh, I'm not translated physically, but as I come to know the Lord in his fullness more, it's a translation from darkness to light. My eyes are getting opened more and more, like a little puppy. <laughs> you know, my eyes are starting to get enlightened and understand the the greatness of God more and more and more. So uh, it's it's uh, it's wonderful as we just come to see um, God's going. God is doing some wonderful things in the earth. You don't see it on on C-SPAN. You don't see it on all the major TV networks. But I'm telling you, there's some powerful things happening in the world. Powerful things that you never, never see them by the media. Chapter 2 uh, in Colossians. Um, Duncan 2, verse 15. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he, being Christ, made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it or in his cross. When Jesus resurrected from the cross, all that power of the devil, what happened to it? It was destroyed. It had no, no power. Uh, I'm so, I, I used to be, um, what's the word? I get a little irritated, irritated in my spirit when I hear great preachers, friends of mine, a lot of them are friends of mine, and others are just people I love and, and admire in, in ministry. Still saying, I uh, heard one the other day, Linda, she, she records every sermon he, he, he preaches on TV, and we go back and listen to him at night, and, and we really, really like him. But he'll add some things. But, Satan this. And I said, that didn't say that in there. That's what religion has taught us. We read that into that. I'm going to show you a scripture here in a little bit. Something that we read into those things. But I'm just saying, uh, to hear most Christians speak in a lot of, a lot of our songs, we've had to edit a lot of our songs. You would think that Satan is omnipresent. Omni, O-M-N-I, means all. You would think Satan is omnipresent. You would think he is omnipotent or look at all potent or omniscient, knowing all things, all powerful and everywhere at all times. You would think that would be the devil. That's the character and that's the essence of God. He's everywhere at all times. He's all powerful. He's all knowing. The devil is so dumb. What makes him smart is us telling him. I'm not saying God destroyed him in, in that sense. I say that God has destroyed his position. Okay? That's why Christ said he has no place in me. You know? He has no place in me. In uh, 1 Corinthians, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. I want to show you something here. 1 Corinthians 
two, seven, and eight. I hope you're learning something, and if it, if you're not learning, I hope it's a confirmation to you. Verse seven says, "But we speak wisdom, the wisdom of God, in a mystery." You see, it takes the Holy Spirit to open your eyes. It takes the Holy Spirit. I, I can even have use this whiteboard and give you 17 steps to how to hear God. That's something you have to have to acquire on your own. It takes, first of all, a hunger. It takes a hunger. I remember when when uh, Sue came. Uh, she said to me, she said, well, <laughs> she said, I've been in service a couple times and I can already sense I'm behind. <laughs> Something to that effect. She said, could you come to my house and teach me? And at that time I was working for one more week on week off and I had ever the week off. I said, I'll teach you 10 lessons. I'll use the, Mo the tabernacle of Moses, the seven feasts of the Lord, and teach that in a New Testament perspective and the Bible from there on will start opening up to you. And we did that. Emily came. She said the other day, she said, can you come to my house and teach us? And I walked in, she said, get a chair, everybody. Get your Bibles, everybody. She just started ripping out orders. Sit down and listen. You know? That's not all of you is able to do that, I understand, because of your work and said, But that, that hunger, when you're hungry, you'll be filled. You know, that, that little voids of different places where you're void of understanding, it'll be filled. I'm not saying I know it all, man. I'm still I'm still searching. There's several things in scripture. I'm still it's still up in the air with me. But I'm I'm searching. But notice what it says, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Uh jump over to verse fourteen. I want to show you this show you something there before I finish reading that, that next verse. Verse 14 says, But the natural man, that's a man who's not received Christ or understood, uh, let me say it another way. Uh, a, a natural man is a man who's uh, not acknowledged the saving grace of God in his life. He knows God's out there. He's not against God. He knows God's out there. He just don't think he's in here, inside of him. That's a natural man. The natural man receives not the, spirit, the things of the Spirit of God. Why? I wrote in my Bible, and the next part says, For they are foolishness to him, neither can he know them. Why? Because they're spiritually discerned. You have to discern them by the Spirit. Uh, there's one thing I've noticed when people come to, to this church, and a lot of them's gone today for a lot of reasons, but when they come here, they can't figure out Holding our message. But they know something's different. You know what they're discerning? They discern their spirit of love here. That gets them. They sense that. Robin and Linda's little girl, how old is Nine. Nine. She came to a few services, sat there and wrote her grandma a note and said, Joyful sound where love is never hidden. A little nine-year-old girl detected that in two services. Where love is never hidden. She already sensed that at nine. There's no telling where God will take her spiritually. Now that little girl's nine years old and has uh, arthritis, right? And she has to take shots for it ever so often. And we're believing the Lord to change that. Amen. And the Lord gave me a word in my spirit this morning while I shaved about her. That there's going to be uh, a change in her that the doctors will detect. That will help her mama. That will help her mama. The doctors need to detect that. Kind of like my mom. My mom had gallbladder uh, attack. We didn't know that's what it was, but Dad always prayed for us. God had just always come through and just. But Dad had a philosophy. He said, "If God don't heal, we're not going to lay it and die. 
We'll go to the doctor. That's the next best. But we're going to trust God first. So many times, it, I remember when Dad was cutting logs, don't let it get away from Mom. He was cutting logs, and a, a tree hit another tree, big old tree, and it bounced back and fell on his leg and knocked the chainsaw out of his hand, and he could barely reach it. He said, I, he, he said, I could just barely touch that. He said, if I could have got a hold of that chainsaw, I could have cranked it up, saw the, the tree off of my leg, and I could have hobbled in back to the sawmill. My dad generally had the sawmill of his own, but this little, little period of time in his life, he's working for another man, he's cutting logs for him, and this great big tree laid on his, he, he hollered so long that day that he lost his voice. Well, Dad didn't come in for lunch, and they were concerned. I thought, well, he's probably just staying out there, going to not come in for lunch that day, come in for mill site. Well, that night, mill shut down, and Dad was still wasn't there, so they started looking. Dad said, they passed right by me, I couldn't. But he lost his voice. They searched, and they searched, and they searched, and they found Dad. And uh, by the time it was dark, and they cut the log off, tree off of him, and got under both arms and got him back to the mill, took him to the hospital. Hospital was on the way home. And it was on Wednesday. We had church on Wednesday night. And the boss was there with Dad and and they uh, uh, they do uh, how they do they check inside of you. X ray you thank you. I said it takes everybody to help me preach. <laughs> the the X ray leg said you know, that bone in his leg was just crushed. And Dad said, you know what? Just give me some crutches. We have church tonight. And I promise I'll sign the, I'll sign the affidavit here that I will not sue my boss. I'll never sue him. Just need to get to church. Dad come in on crutches. Now, Dad played the piano at church. We had this old upright piano. And this tall piano and had a bouquet of flowers sitting up there. And some of those men who weren't very spiritual would come, they brought their wives to church. They'd sit on the back of their little bimbo for all of it. They'd, they'd have a little gambling going back there that tonight the, the flowers are going to turn over because Dad rocked that piano. <laughs> so, so anyway, they prayed for Dad before service started. Dad played the piano that night. Called his boss that night as soon as he got home. said, you can pick me up in the morning and I'll be ready for work. They said, say what? He said, I'll be ready for work. And the day Dad died two years ago, that, that was back in the 60s. Never had anything done to his leg. So he just believed in prayer. We, and get things that happened to us kids, he prayed and it was okay. Well, Mom got this gallbladder attack. I don't know why I'm telling this. Somebody here needs this. This is where you call running by the seat of your pants. No, it's following the Spirit, you know. And uh, Dad prayed for her and nothing happened. So Dad just said, we're going to the hospital. Took her to the hospital and her, her gallbladder full of gallstones. And the doctor said, we'll operate in the morning, first thing in the morning. So Dad goes down to this Catholic hospital and he goes to a little chapel and he says, Lord, if I missed you on something, nobody know. Because you always come through for us. Now, God wasn't punishing Mom. Okay? You with me there? But... Dad said, the Lord revealed to me, revealed him, said, I spoke to you six or eight weeks ago. He, uh, he, it wasn't six, four, eight. His dad knew at the time exactly how long it was. He said, I saw, told you to send $40 to T.L. Osborne as a missionary. And he didn't do it. Dad said, is that stopping this? <laughs> dad just got a went to the post office that morning. Got a money order. T.L. Osborne, missionary, sent it to him. Come back and told the doctor, said, don't operate. Got a hold of doctor. Now, doctor's a friend of ours. He's a spiritual-minded man as well. But he said, he told me, he said, don't, don't operate till you take another X-ray. Came out. He said, man, here's my, here's my X-ray last night. Here's my X-rays today. There's no gallstones. He said, the state laws of Missouri will not allow me to operate. There's nothing, there's nothing in there like that. Well, that was in the 60s also. When Mom lived until 2007, never, ever, ever had another gallbladder attack. I'm just telling you, I grew up with that. 
So see the mighty work, the mighty power of God work, and it hasn't stopped. There's a little boy that that, uh, that Iris knows about that he's had cancer, brain cancer, and his, his mother is a nurse. And of course, you know, when you're a nurse, it's harder to bleed. Uh, it's harder to bleed because you know stuff is going on internally. But Iris took that little boy as her own little project. She started even, you're not really good friends with them, are you? Or, I just, when I thought, when I was drawing to him, I did not know that I knew the family. Okay. But I'm not close to him. Yeah. She just took that little boy as, in her, her spiritual project and started speaking life, started speaking life. And I'd say it on Facebook, so I'd come in and, and sub, and, and Iris would come back and say other things. We'd just speak life, and I'd say, he's going to grow up, and he's going to enjoy it playing baseball and whatever, I don't know what all I said. But he's supposed to be dead a long time ago. He's 35 in January, still alive. And they said there's nothing more than they can do. But he's stable. But he's stable. So I'm just saying, we speak life. We speak life. Speak life where there seems to not be life. Amen. I'm just saying, God is so faithful, the devil has no power. You speak life. Speak life in no situation. Now notice, but we speak the wisdom of God a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world and to, we're in verse 7. Back that up to verse 7. Okay. There, there you go. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained from before the world and to whose glory? Our glory. Now, scoot that up on the screen a little bit. Verse 8. Which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified who? The Lord of glory. Now, if the devils are so smart, now look at that. They're not so smart. They're, the devil does not have this. Christians are notor notorious. Even in many of our songs, it's like the devil does this, the devil does that, the devil, you know. Uh, I mean, I grew up in a church. If a guy broke a guitar string, the devil don't want me to sing tonight. Yeah. No, you broke a string. Yeah. <laughs> you had a flat tire from the church. Going to church. The devil didn't want me to come to church. Well, you know, get better tires. <laughs> you know, that's all I can say. Let's, let's be reasonable about this. <laughs> oh my gosh. So it's, it's just like we have no responsibility. It's all, we just blame it on the devil. We can just go our merry way. Now look, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. I want, to, I want to make a profound statement here. If we're still fighting devils, think about this. We are denying the finished work of Calvary. If we're still fighting devils, we're denying that Christ already took, dealt with it. Jesus said in John 17, 4, I have finished the work he sent me to do. In John chapter 19, verse 30, while on the cross, he said, It is finished. Bowed his head in the King James Version and said he gave up the ghost. When he said it's finished, now here again, I think outside the box, I think, what did he finish? I don't think God's mad at us for asking questions. If Lord, you said it's finished, I think I need to know what did you finish? John chapter 1, verse this big John chapter 1 verse 29 <clears throat> it says the next day John saith Jesus coming unto him and saith behold the Lamb of God which taketh away sin as in singular 
The next day John sees Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. There's one sin that covers it all. And that's the sin of unbelief. What was the sin of the world? Unbelief. Unbelief caused Adam to default, let me say it that way, in his relationship with God. God had given him all power, all knowledge. I mean, everything that come by, God brought everything by. He gave everything a name according to its nature. I just think when a mosquito come by, I ought to swat it did. But <laughs> and a few others, you know. But he gave everything. I'm telling you, that's pretty sharp. That's pretty knowledgeable when you got the ability to name everything that can, that had lived and moved and had breath. He named everything. He had he had the garden to his disposal. Didn't have to hold weed. It was wonderful. It was paradise. And yet he gave all of that authority to the devil or Satan, same synonymous. So his relationship now with God is marred. And it says here, the next day John said Jesus coming and said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away this unbelief. So he's created a situation where all mankind has the ability to believe. Isn't that wonderful? Now, let me throw this in, just for good measure. Now, I've been taught free will all my life. I have since come through lots of years of study. I've since come to, I think, here's where I am. This is my, my uh, discernment. We have limited free will. If my will, now hold on to your seat, fasten your seat belts in. If my will could send me to hell, then my will is bigger than God's will. Now Jesus came on the cross to redeem the human race. He came to redeem the human race to take it back from where Adam had took it down. And if Adam had that ability to bring the whole human race down under devastation and degradation and, and all of that, uh, and Jesus didn't have the ability to, to redeem them, then my doctrine would say that Adam's ability to sin was greater than Jesus' ability to redeem that make sense? So if the whole human race is redeemed, the whole human race is reconciled, my question to myself, how come we see so much devastation? Would that be a good question? Because they don't know the knowledge of his will. And Christians spend so much time fighting everybody, nobody wants to come and hear about it. Right? Let's learn to love in spite of. You know, there's, there's, there's situations, as a, I use my old saying, I'd rather bust my brick. But I won't get very far and, and helping that person down to come into the knowledge of God's will of doing that. And if I say hurtful things, I push them away. The Bible says we have the power to remit sin. Now, that's a big one for me. I, that, I, that, that's a big pill for me to swallow. I've said no to that for a long time. And I questioned that. And I said, Lord, how do we have the power to remit sin? How do we have the power to to cause people to forgive and all that. And the Lord said this, I only can forgive. But by your words, you'll speak words of life 
and words of faith and not hurtful words, you take that wall down where people can begin to hear and let God talk to their heart. But I don't like them. <laughs> I think God will go to hell. After all, they deserve it, you know. I remember telling Terry one time, I said, you know, Christians want people to go to hell. He said, I never forgot that. <laughs> Christians ought to want people to love God. Yes. People ought to want people to go to heaven. Amen? Amen? Alright. So, what is the sin of the world? It's unbelief. The same sin that Adam committed in the garden. He quit believing in God and believed the lie. Okay? Now you can raise that, Joyce. I want you to put one word up there. Oh, here's a racer right here. I want us to name our enemy. We've kindly come to the conclusion here. I think we've come to a consensus. I think to a consensus that the set, that the devil's been dealt with, right? Are we there so far? Yeah. Amen. We've come to that conclusion that the devil's been dealt with. He has no power. Jesus has it all. All power is given to me in heaven and earth. So, if we figure that out. Let's figure out what our enemy really is. Could that be so? Let's put the first one up there. Here's an enemy. Fear. Yep. That's an enemy. And sometimes fear gets so big we think it's a demon. <coughs> Turn, uh, uh, go to 1 John. Let's go to John in the back. 1 John 4.18. Duncan. John 14. It says, there is no fear in love. Now, what is love? God is love. Let's say it together. God is love. Let's say it again. God is love. Now listen, God don't have love. He don't have a little piece of love. That's the very essence of God. And I've said this before. I don't know much about, if I brought Mike up here, he's an engineer. He could tell us more what this components of this is. There's, I know there's a lot of plastic in that. Four thousand dollars. What Carla said. <laughs> and I don't know if these are real ivories or not, but it's got other things on the inside of it. What, what would be some things on the inside of it, Micah? Okay, like a circuit board. It's probably not plastic. It's that made out. Of, I'm just saying. That's the essence of this keyboard here. It's made out of all these components. But the essence of God is just love. That's all He is. And it says here in 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love. God has no fear. God's not passing out fear to anybody. He has no fear. But perfect love casteth out fear. There's one thing when God's love is in us in a mature state, it'll cast out fear. Fear has what? Torment. There's a lot of people tormented by that. There's, there's fear of the unknown. Uh, well, what if I buy this vehicle and it breaks down tomorrow? You know, it can happen. But many of it does dumb stuff to the world. The Bible says the foolishness of the world is not foolishness with God. And we went and laid our hands on our vehicle we buy and we said, Father, we just thank you for this tool. It's not new. Somebody put 57,000 miles or 37,000 miles on it. But we're believing and it's going to do more than normal. I had an amplifier. I've got to tell you this little story. Almost like this one. And every time I get an instrument, we've done this. I took this amplifier and I just brought it to church. I said, I want some of them to get around and anoint this amplifier. We just took a little olive oil. Uh, there's no power in the olive oil. It's just, it's just a, 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 a symbol. 
We poured a little olive oil on that and get people together down. We laid hands on this amplifier. And we just said, Father, I just think that this amplifier will never do anything but glorify the Lord. Well, I played on that amplifier for several years and the transformer went out of it. So I took the music store and the guy on the music store, I knew him, I said, David, I think the transformer is out, but you check it out. And he fixed it in about 40 bucks, I think, back then. I don't know what a, what a transformer would be now. But anyway, I played on another year or two or three, and the transformer went out again. Maybe I didn't play on it that long, but it went out too quick, I thought. So I thought I'm going to trade this. I took this amplifier back into David Capp's music store at Salem, and I said, Dave, this amp does not work. I want to be upfront with you and honest. I think the transformer's out again. But you can fix it. Yeah, I can fix it. He said, it really don't work. I said, plug it in. I said, it won't make a sound. So he plugged it in, and it didn't make a sound. He said, oh, I can fix it. I'll give you a good trade on it. He'll give me a good trade. <laughs> so anyway. Oh, to, to, so he just kind of set it back in the corner. And a couple months later, a band that was playing in, in town came in. He drug his lamp out, plugged it in, just worked perfect. And they bought that amp and played at the nightclub there in town that, that weekend. Well, time went by, maybe another year or two went by, and, and uh, we got this little band going. I played guitar, and a Christian church pastor, he played the drums, and he played drums all the way through, high school, or through college. That's why he earned his way through college. And the... the uh, manager the radio station he played guitar and him and his wife sang and we had all different church people there that played different instruments we had this fellowship meeting once a month and this funeral baptist preacher coming he said can i play with y'all we said yeah he brought me that and i said that's my old amp <laughs> he said i would you buy that he said i bought over david Katz. he said it wasn't working i said that is my old amp he said, I pulled it out and plugged in and worked for me. He said, well, I'll just give you a good deal on it. No, it don't work. He said, well, it worked for me. He said, we went down and played bar that weekend. He said, but something happened. He said, there's four, four of us brothers, and we all sang together and played together. He said, we started getting saved. And I told him this story. I said, we laid hands on that amp and said, it was good. Play nothing but gospel music. Just think the power was in that. We didn't go preaching a sermon. He said, we drank like a fish after we, after we played in those bars. But he said, that weekend is the only weekend we played on that amp. We started getting saved. He said, all of us brothers are all preaching the gospel today. That's the only weekend we played anything but gospel music. That, he sat there like a baby and his chin was jumping and the tears just flowing. He said, you mean you laid hands on that and prayed? I said, that's what, the, the power of God. The Bible says spirits like the wind. <laughs> it comes and you can't see it, you can't feel it, you don't know where it went to and how it got there, but it just went. He said, you know, I've not put a transformer in that amp yet today and it still works. And I said, you're saved preaching the gospel too, ain't you? He said, yeah. I don't know how, why things work like that, but God just works in things. He honors his word. We just simply laid hands on that hand and said, we are going to play gospel music. And he's playing gospel music today if he ain't traded it off. Amen. Anger. Anger's another enemy. It gets so big in us sometimes we just think it's a devil. Go to Ephesians, Duncan. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 31. Verse 31 says, Let's see. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and rammer and evil speaking but be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Put this aside. Now we've already understood the devil's been dealt with, right? But how many times in all of us 
this is jumped up in our face. Maybe between our mate. Maybe between our kid. Maybe between the neighbor, barking dog. I talked to a Christian fellow just last week. He said, my neighbor's dog barked so much, he said, I've called the police on him 20 times. I thought, you know, it would be hard to win that person to Christ. I don't like barking dogs either, but, you know, he said, they just get at my fence and they just bark all night long. He said, and it gets my dogs barking, so. Yeah, I called the police on the police and the police said, you're finally going to just file a report. He says, I filed a report. Nothing happened yet. So I went over there and I got pretty testy with them. You know, I just thought, this person who's talking to me has at least physical ailments. What if he's ever thought once, just being nice to his neighbor, what if that might change his ailments? I don't know if it would or not. Can't lose. <laughs> Couldn't be any worse. Amen. But anger. It's like a demon to some people. And you know what we say? Now, I take that back. We don't say it. Present company accepted. <laughs> Oftentimes Christians will say, well, my dad was that way. Or my grandpa the same way. Well, the buck needs to stop here. Amen. Somewhere we need to call that into to whatever. Stop it. We call that a familiar spirit or a family spirit. When dad and grandpa and all that. It doesn't mean it's the devil. It means they just yielded to that, that thing every time. Colossians uh, 3.8. Okay. Colossians 3.8. And it says, but now, you, but now you also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, and filthy communications out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you put these, put off all the old man, the deeds of the old man. These is the nature of Adam. After he sinned, his own first boy killed his own brother. Once he sinned, all of these attributes started showing up in family members. It says, and put on the new man, which is renewed in, in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So on. Our next one is shame. Shame. I talked to a person the other day in my house. And I helped them in our arms as they laid their head on our shoulder and sobbed. And here was the problem shame. The lifestyle that they lived before seems to overtake them. And it becomes like a devil. I'm not saying it is. And just the shame, the guilt, shame that, that people, it's hard to pull out from under that. Who was uh, talking to somebody recently, their parents abused them. They feel that shame and they feel like, another lady talked about a divorce. She said, you know, she said, I felt like when I walked in the church, I had it stamped on my forehead. <laughs> divorce. He said, because when you're divorced in most churches, you can't say nothing. I said, well, they take your money? Oh, yeah, they do that. <laughs> well, they let you clean the church? Yeah, they let you do that. So I had her come and speak at church one time. She walked up to the pulpit. She said, well, first of all, she said, I'm divorced. <laughs> Remember that, Carla? <laughs> she said, I'm divorced twice. <laughs> As you begin to talk to mention of the church about the shame and the guilt that comes with that, that people need to shake off. God's not mad at you. God's not mad at you. If that happened in your past, it's in your past. Don't bring it into your present because if you bring it into your present, you'll never have a future. Shake it off. 
And she just began to tell her life story and how that every place she went, she, the people knew her divorce, you know, you just be kind of like sit in the corner type thing, you know, that feeling. You're not worthy. And I'm telling you, God's made everybody worthy. God's made everybody worthy. Without Him, we're not. But with Him, you know, uh, I, sorry, Isaac Newton wrote that song, Amazing Grace. And he says, I was a, I was a wretch. Or he said, a wretch like me. Actually, we weren't wretches, but we felt like that, didn't we? The, our disobedience that we walked in made us feel like a wretch. But God doesn't have no junk. Amen? What about, uh, let's look at Philippians. Chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. Philippians. Three. We're just about done for the day. <clears throat> okay, we'll start with verse 17. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have as for an example. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. These, let me say this, these are the enemies of what Christ did. It doesn't say it's the devil, but it keeps you from winning in those areas. It keeps you from winning. <clears throat> whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, whose mind, who mind earthly things. But our conversation is in heaven, or we speak of heavenly things. All right, another one is lack. Lack. Well, the devil just stole it from me. No. You know, my lack was because I spent more than I made. I had no budget. If I had it, I spent it. I thought I was going to live forever. <laughs> I was bullet bulletproof. You know, nothing's going to happen to me. Beside Jesus come tonight, so why worry? It's not a demon. It's lack. But sometimes it gets so big in our families, it's like the devil's working there. It's not the devil. Just go to the Bible. You know the Bible says, train up a child the way he should go on his own and not depart from it. You know he's talking about money there? Talking about money. Teach your kids. You know, Carla, Emmy's working at, uh, she's still working over there, Steak and Shake. And we, we miss some Sundays, and then she, if she gets $60 tip, I mean, she's got an, she's got an envelope, she puts $6 in there, she put in this offering. She scrapes it right off the top, her 10%. And she got really distraught because one Sunday we called church off. What am I going to do? <laughs> you know, somebody had taught her to give off the top. And she had more tips that week and no place to give. <laughs> she thought, you know, you can go find the homeless, you know. <laughs> but I just thought, Emmy, you're getting started off right. Amen. She just wanted to give. A lack of confidence lack of confidence. Now, we have a saying in church, they have no self-esteem. Now, I stay away from that term because self is what gets us in, pro in trouble. Can I say it this way? Self is the Antichrist. It's when I rule on my throne and not Christ, that's the Antichrist. And I can prove that by Scripture. Well, that'll be another sermon for another day. But anyway, self. So it's not self-esteem we want. We want confidence. <coughs> and a lack of that feels like the devil's running over a rough shot when we have no confidence. What about uh, a diagnosis? A diagnosis. That seems like a demon. That will give me cancer. No. Maybe you've been stressed out so long that caused it. 
diabetes. Maybe it's because we ate the wrong stuff. Maybe it wasn't the devil at all. In ministry, I've been in ministry 40 some years and, and we've been around a lot of folks. And I've watched this, and I, I don't want to be critical because God, I got I need to lose 50 pounds. So this I got one finger point just so I got three myself. But I've watched the people that are struggling with diabetes. Uh, think, well, if I just take a shot, I can eat two pieces of pie. We were sitting down here at AJ's uh, reception one time, and there's a preacher there, and he was starting to get sick, and uh, he, saw, he said, well, one piece of pie, and he just pulled up his shirt and told my brother, Mark was up here, he said, give me a shot, a little piece of pie. So undisciplined. Now, I went by and got two, two cookies last night, and I was up on my scales this morning, and, Linda said to me, she said, he went by and got too many cookies last night. I said, only two. She said, now I saw you earlier two fig newtons too. <laughs> I said, I did. I did. So I have no stones to throw to anybody. But no discipline causes some of these things. What about emotions? Sometimes people don't have cancer. They may not be mad, but their emotions, their emotions so out of whack. It's just like they're, they're demonic sometimes. When the Bible is just so full of things about being calm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He does this, he does that. He leads me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Goodness and mercy follow me. We just don't read those things. And if we don't know what his will book says, then these things become part of us. Amen? Luke 10. Oh. Try to finish up here. Luke 10. Verse 18 and 19 there. I know the screen's got it, but I like to see it in my Bible too. Luke 10. Notice. And he said unto them, Jesus speaking, I beheld Satan as lightning do what? fall from heaven. That don't mean the place up there 50 miles north of Mars. Let me, let me say it another way. There's another scripture that says, Awake all ye heavens! Can I use you, Iris? Think about these heavens here. Even the medical science calls this a temple. And Jesus said, I've seen him fall as lightning. You remember when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness? The Bible says, of the devil. And he said, you know, Jesus had just fasted 40 days. Now listen, the Bible says afterwards he was hungry. I was some kind of hungry. I fasted 10 days. Man, I saw him. I had a mom. It was right through Christmas vacation, Christmas time. And I said, anybody gets a piece of this pecan pie, they're going to get a fork in their hand. Because I'm eating this fork. I keep eating this pie after 10 days. <laughs> and I did. It's the one that I didn't get sick. I ate that whole pie. <laughs> I had understood a little bit about Jesus that afterwards he was hungry. How did Satan tempt him? The first thing he did, if you be the Son of God, change these stones into bread. Could he have? Sure he could have. 
Now, I personally don't think that the devil's out there in red underwear and a dunce hat and a pitchfork. But I think Jesus sitting out there in the wilderness. I think this this is me, and I'll tell you where I get this at. Because he said he was tried and tempted in every way just like I was. Just like you are. And I've never seen the devil with red underwear on and a red dunce hat, a long tail, and carrying a pitchfork. But I have held him to deal with my mind. And I have had him last week to say, if you're healed, then how come you're not feeling good? I have had him say, if you're prospering, how come you ain't got two pennies to rub together? Jesus said, I've seen him fall. It's like, hey. But out there when Satan tempted him, man, I, I, got, I could change these stones into bread, but man shall not live by bread alone. These are thoughts coming through his head. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The word, the little suffix on the end of a word, E-T-H, means ongoing. So man should not live by bread alone, but every word that keeps coming out of your mouth, that's how you live. Every time he was tempted, he come back. You know, I don't think the devil took him under his arm and said, I'm going to take you out here to the pinnacle of the temple. And I think he sat right there on a the rock. Man, if I could just... You see, nobody understood why Jesus came. He kept telling his disciples, and Peter said, no, it ain't that way at all. John the Baptist is the only fella that knew why Jesus came. And Jesus is getting closer and closer and closer to coming to the cross. He's saying, man, what does it take to persuade these people? If I just turn these rocks into bread, maybe they'd believe me. If I just jump off the pinnacle of the temple and see that it didn't hurt me, But that ain't gonna work either. And he went on tempted him. The Bible said every time he just kept saying something that the scripture said. You know, the Bible says afterwards the angels came and ministered to him. Uh, you know, after we just speak the word of God, the Bible, the Bible says the angels came and ministered. Somebody will minister to you. Something will happen. If you overcome anger and you just refuse to get mad over the situation. There's times when we had lack. Lynn and I didn't know what to do next. So we just joined hands. Sometimes the bedroom, sometimes the bathroom, sometimes around the kitchen table. But we just joined hands with the Lord. We don't know. We don't know what to do. My job only pays so much. We got these many bills. That's my fault. I remember one time we was on the way to church. Kids, three kids sitting in the back seat. And we're just singing in the spirit. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord. We praise and adore you. I'm driving. We're all singing along. I don't remember which one of the kids said it, but they said this. I thank you, Lord, that my mom and dad has $900. $900 bill due the next day and no money for it. Something about the Spirit just works. We went to church that Sunday night and a lady who's had her own set of problems put a $10 check in my hand. We didn't have she was a baby. Sherry's about two. Put a check in her hand and I said, Linda, here's $10. I stopped to get the kids some food. We got home. We, we cried all the way to the store and got some food for the kids. And <coughs> got home and Linda screamed in the bedroom. And I said, What happened? She said, This is $1,000. It ain't 10 <laughs> We had. More money to get groceries with and to pay the nine hundred dollars. 
simply because a little kid in the back seat felt impressed by the Spirit to sing it. And he said, we got like, we have, my mom and dad has $900. We didn't talk it over with the kids. Never. That's one thing my parents taught me. You know, my parents, they, they just, I grew up thinking everybody that said they love the Lord, love the Lord. I found out later that a lot of them didn't. <laughs> but I didn't hear from mom and dad. God just works. And it says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy. He hadn't come to the cross yet. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. We have power over all of these things. Now I want you to look at this list here. Notice, every one of those are things that, can, that are affected by our five physical senses. Help me out. Taste, touch, smell, see, hear. You know, you can just hear something. You know, you know, news affects the affects the uh, uh, Wall Street. It don't have to be true. It will affect Wall Street. It'll affect your stock if you got stock invested. Just news. Good news can push it up, bad news can push it down, and the good news might not be right, neither could the bad news may be right, but it still affects it. Anger affects us, affects our relationship. Shame keeps us from really walking in the light of the Lord. All these things are affected by emotions, our five physical senses. I have one last scripture and we're going to go home. I want you to go to Isaiah chapter 59. I'll just let you find it. Isaiah 59 verse 19. I want you to look at this list again. All these things creates a devil for us. I'm not saying it is a devil. I'm just saying it creates that kind of feeling. Because we eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay. Isaiah 59, 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and from his and his glory from the rising of the sun. Notice this. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Against him. Now, how many have witnessed a really major flood sometime? Have you ever noticed it just makes you feel helpless? Now, I've watched some big buildings burn, but I knew that in time, they got enough fire trucks there. It may take all night. It may take half the next day, but they'd finally bring that, that fire under control. But a flood, you can't do anything about because it just goes down on its own. Now, when, when the prophet Isaac spoke, he didn't speak with... Uh, punctuation. Those are put in there later. So let's read this again. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and in glory from the rising of the sun or from the east. When the enemy shall come in. Let's put the comma right there. Instead of after flood. Like a flood. The Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Like a flood. That's how the standard will be. God lifted up so overwhelmingly against that situation. When the enemy shall come in, like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. I've seen water so out of control. Linda's dad used to haul milk. He had a milk truck loaded with milk. And he started to cross this bridge, which he'd crossed many times, and could drive across it blindfolded probably, but the water was so fierce in this little have you ever floated Jack's Fork, Frank, down in there? Jack's Fork River or Current River? Jack's Fork River? That, that's not a big river, but it washed his, his truck down and washed him right off the bridge. Washed his truck away. He, he managed to get out. But, but the flood is, is powerful. When the enemy, it may be fear, anger, shame, lack, or lack of confidence, 
or a diagnosis of emotions, and you can add it to the, your list, make your own list. When that comes in, like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord can be a standard against it. But I'm telling you what, it's, it's hard to build a bridge when the flood's out. When the flood is overflowing, but they have technology to do that today. Don't wait till, uh, till something big has come in your life to start studying and start seeking the Lord and start committing your life to the Lord. Don't wait till that happens. Just while things are good, before anything would happen, just thank the Lord. Be a thankful person, people. Be a thankful people. Father, I just thank you. I have no lack. I just thank you. I'm not walking in fear. Anger's not going to control me. It's not going to control my husband, my wife, my kids, my uncle, my aunt, my dad, my mom, anybody. Fear's not going to be a part of our mode of operation. We thank you, Father. We live above shame. Hallelujah. We're the glory of the Lord in the earth. Lack is not a part of our operation. We just give everywhere we go. We just bless people everywhere we go. Thank you, Lord. We have the wherewithal. You didn't just make it where we just barely exist. But you're an abundant God. Where we can give here and we can give there. Thank you, Lord. We have confidence in you. It's you, Christ, in me, the hope of glory. Not, not me all by myself because I'm a wretched failure. But with you and me and understanding the mystery of his will. Father, I thank you have confidence. No diagnosis is going to take me down. I'm just going to be thankful in every situation. In everything I'm going to give thanks. My emotions are going to be stable. The only thing I'm going to be really emotional about is really, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Radical praise. Hallelujah. I've seen you all just marching around here today, just doing something different. Probably Frank and Sharon come in, what in the world is going on here? <laughs> anyway, I oh, would do radical stuff. So the first time we've done that in ages. <laughs> We did it today. Amen. God is faithful. Amen. Let's all pray. Father, we just thank you today for these great folks. Thank you, Lord, for all the folks that weren't here today for all those reasons. The girls that's in Spain, we thank you God for a safe trip back this week. And we thank you, Lord, that in Dale's situation, that family stands strong. As we go down there today to the hospital, help us, Lord, to say words of faith and encouragement to them. Thank you, Lord. And all the prayer requests that we prayed about today, that you'll be working in those. Thank you, Father. We just thank you in advance. <coughs> thank you for Frank and Sharon coming today. We thank you. Bless them abundantly. Beyond all they could ask or think. All the rest of these folks, I ask you to bless them. Above all that they could ask or think. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your name, Lord. We just give you praise and glory and honor. You're so magnificent. You're so wonderful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's all stand. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Can you remember that song in everything give thanks? I think that's in uh, 1 Thessalonians. Uh, uh, Let me see if I can find it. I'm going to sing it as we close here today. 1 first, first Thessalonians 1 5.
y'all have a wonderful day. Remember, do not have the dinner. Is that supposed to be next Sunday? Or not have that next Sunday. It was for Dale's birthday, but you know, see what's going to happen there. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful week.